This is another lecture on consumer theory, consumer choices. <clears throat> um, and now we're going to start to build out our model. Um, not just, so we have all the constituent par parts, and now we're going to start to build out our model to make um, predictions or, or actually try to derive consumer behavior um, from preferences. So um, just a, a quick recap of what's going on. We built this consumer model, and it had three parts to it. Um, it had that objects of choice were vectors in Rn, and they represented bundles of consumption. So a, a vector in R3 would be three different types of consumption, something like apples, bananas, and cherries. Um, and each element of the vector would correspond to the number of bananas, uh, apples, bananas, and cherries. Um, and these are indivisible goods, so they can take any positive real number. Um, they don't have to be integer amounts. The second part was a budget set. So we said that not every bundle of goods is choosable, is a feasible bundle. The only ones that can be chosen are those that are affordable. And what we mean by affordable is that there's a vector of prices. That's also a vector in Rn, which describes the price of apples, bananas, and cherries. And the total cost of a bundle is the dot product or inner product between the price vector and the bundle, right? So it's the price of apples times the amount of apples plus the price of bananas times the amount of bananas time plus the price of cherries times the amount of cherries. And we need that that cost, the total cost of the bundle is less than some predetermined income. And for the moment, we're taking prices as given and we're taking the income as given. We're assuming that this just comes from the sky and we're going to worry about where those things come from later in the course. Um, now what we're going to want to do with that model is, oh, and the, the third part of the model is a utility function which describes how much does each, uh, how much does the consumer like each bundle. And remember that this is a function that takes vectors in Rn and, as, and assigns them some number. And what matters is if a number is bigger, the number assigned to a bundle, the utility assigned to a bundle, is bigger than the utility assigned to some other bundle. And a bigger utility means that the, the, the decision maker or the consumer prefers the bundle with the bigger utility. That was the interpretation. So if the utility of bundle X is greater than the utility of bundle Y, that means that the consumer would choose bundle X instead of bundle Y if both of them were available. Um, and what we assumed is that the, that the decision maker is going to be maximizing her utility, which means choosing the bundle that renders the highest utility given the budget set. So that's sort of where we're at, and now we're going to start to analyze what does that actually mean. So what does it actually mean to maximize utility over a budget set? What does that look like? And the reason we're going to do that is that we're going to then be able to apply this model to economic and market settings by making predictions about the way that prices and income affect the consumer's decision. Um, we're also going to be able to talk about things like welfare implications. So is the consumer better off under some set of prices than a different set of prices? And if it's the case that we know that someone's better off, then maybe we want to make policy or institute regulation that pushes people in that direction, pushes prices in that direction. So that's sort of the roadmap of where we're heading. Now, um, recall that the, you know, notationally, a consumer has an income, which we're going to denote by I. I is a real number. That's just the amount of money that the consumer has and faces some prices P and P is a vector in Rn. So when we're working in Rn, we have to have a price for each good. So if we're thinking about R3 and the three fruits, this would be P1 is the price of apples, P2 is the price of bananas, and P3 is the price of cherries. This defines a decision problem, which is going to be represented by the budget set given P and I, and that's all vectors in Rn. Really, it should be Rn plus. We only allow positive consumption for the moment. Um, we don't think that you can owe bananas or owe cherries. So these are going to be positive vectors such that the price times the quantity uh, summed across all the goods is less than the income. Now, because we're assuming that these things are linearly traded off so that the price is constant, what I mean by linearly traded off is that the prices are constant. So if you buy one apple, you're paying the same price as if you buy 100 apples. There's no quantity discounts or bundling or anything like that, which is the case in the real world. And of course, would throw a wrench into all of our analysis. And uh, you could redo this with more complicated situations where you say, if you buy more than 10 units, you get it for cheaper, right? And uh, believe me, that's going to cause some problems. Uh, and you might even try to think about what problems are those going to cause. So that's a good exercise. What is the problem if, you know, thinking down the line, what is the problem that, that arises if we get rid of this um, constant price trade-off? 
But given that there's price, constant prices, notice that this is what a budget set looks like. Um, on the y-axis, we have, you know, if there's two goods on the y-axis, you can buy i divided by py worth of y if that's all you buy. So if all you're buying is, is y and you spend all your money on it, you can buy in your entire budget divided by the price of y. Right? So if your budget was 10 and the cost was 5, you could buy 2 units. If your budget was 100 and the cost was 20, you could buy uh, still 5 units. Um, so the uh, on the x-axis, you have the same thing, but it's i over px. And that's how much of x you could buy if all you bought was x. And your budget set is everything that lies on the line below the line that connects them. Okay, And the slope of that line is negative px divided by py. Right, so it's pretty easy to see that that's the case if you just play around with this stuff. Maybe draw out an example or two and convince yourself that the slope of that line is negative px over py. So um, there's a there's an assumption lurking behind here, and that's that prices do not change in the amount purchased. This is sort of what I was talking about before. Um, in fact, we're really not even assuming that we're just assuming the prices come from somewhere, and we are going to analyze where they come from later, but. For right now, um, we're taking prices as given, and that's called a price-taking assumption. It simplifies the analysis um, despite being sort of a suspect of an assumption, and we will return to it. So here's what we have. Here's the setup. We, we have a utility function. We have an income. We have prices. Those things are all given to us, and now the question is, what does the consumer choose? Right. That is our problem as an economist, is to say, given the utility function, given the income, Given the vector of prices, what is the bundle that the decision maker will choose, that the consumer will choose? And the solution to that is going to be to maximize the utility function subject to x being inside of that budget set. So recall that the, the arg max of u of x means that we're going to choose an x which maximizes u. So arg max means an, a vector that maximizes the function. So arg max means the argument that maximizes the following function. And it's subject to a constraint that x is an element of the budget set, right? So we can't choose an arbitrary bundle. Maybe we then we choose infinite amounts. Instead, we're just choosing one that's affordable. So one inside that budget set that's defined by our income and our vector of prices. These are the bundles, the bundles that satisfy that equation, right, that or satisfy this uh, optimization problem that are the arg max are going to be the ones that the, the consumer might demand when she faces the uh, prices and income. And we're going to give a name to that because this is a this is something of particular interest, so we're going to call it Walrasian demand. So this is named after a guy named Walra, Walra. And we're going to hear a lot about Walra. <laughs> It's a bit of a tongue twister of a name. You can hear a bunch about him. He's done a lot of stuff on the foundation of, of consumer theory. Um, he, he gets named quite often. Um, and sometimes this is also called um, uh, Marshallian demand for Marshall. So uh, if you hear Marshallian demand in a different, uh, if in, in, in a different course or a different textbook, that's the same thing. And sometimes it's called uncompensated demand. Um, and the reason it's called uncompensated demand uh, will become clear later, but really what it means is that you're you're not compensated for changes in price. Um, hold off on that and we will get back to it. So um, what is the Walrasian demand? It's a correspondence from Rn plus plus times R plus to Rn plus. So what does that mean? Let's try to parse, right? This means that it, it's 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 a function, it's a mathematical function, comes from somewhere and goes to somewhere. So the first Rn plus plus is this, the vector of prices, right? So that's a vector of prices. And the second R plus is the income. So it says, given a vector of prices and an income, I want you to return me a vector in Rn plus, which is going to be the bundle of consumption. Okay, so it's a correspondence means that it can be many valued. It might not be that there's a unique solution to this. There might be more than one bundle that's maximal. And we're going to allow, we're going to want to understand all of the budget, all of the, the things the consumer might demand. So the Walrasian demand is, uh, is the set of all points that maximize U subject to P uh, and I, uh, according to P and I, so subject to being in the budget set. So the definition, the formal definition is below us, x star has two arguments. It has two arguments, a vector of prices and an income. And given the vector of prices and an income, 
x star is the maximum of the utility function subject to the bundle being affordable, which means p dot y is less than i. So the first thing that we're, we're going to just lay on the table about while raising demand is that uh, if u is a monotone function, then the consumer spends all of her income. Um, and that's going to be essentially, this is always true. In fact, it's true in a more general context. U doesn't have to be strictly monotone. It can be have a weaker property called local non-satiation, which don't worry about. But for this class, we can think about strictly monotone U. So if U is strictly monotone, we don't have to worry about the fact that we have to check every element of the budget set. We only have to check things on that line. So remember what the budget set looks like. Uh, you have this gray triangle. And while Ra's law says as long as U is strictly monotone, you're not going to choose a point down in the gray triangle. You're going to choose a point on the boundary, on that black line, on the line that connects uh, I divided by PY and I divided by PX. You're going to spend all your income. Now, this should be intuitively really obvious. The consumer has no value for money except that it provides consumption. And strict monotonicity says more consumption is better. So you'll never leave money on the table because if you left money on the table, you could have converted that into consumption, which you would have enjoyed because you have a strictly monotone utility function. Okay, so let me run through that logic one more time because it's important. If U is strictly monotone, then I'm going to eat, I'm going to use my entire budget. Now, why am I going to use my entire budget? Because money doesn't provide me utility except when I can convert it into consumption. And I always prefer more consumption to less consumption. So if I had money left over, I wouldn't want to just keep it around. I would want to spend it on something. So the optimal point can never be one in which I don't spend all my money. Um, it's pretty easy to think if U is not strictly monotone that this is not true, right? So perhaps if U is some kind of you know parabola shape, I would want something right in the middle, right? A very specific amount. I wouldn't want to consume any more, and so consuming more hurts me. I don't spend my 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 leftover money. But when U is strictly monotone, Wara's law will hold. So let's take an example to close out this video. So take a, an agent has a utility function of log of x plus log of y. So it's a, we're, we're working with R2. The agent consumes two different types of goods. So bundles are vectors of an X component and a Y component. And there's going to be a vector of prices that she faces, which is X is the price 1 and Y is the price 2. So Y is twice as expensive as X. And she has some amount of money I to spend. I is some real number, um, whatever, right? Now we can set up the problem, right? We set up the problem. What is the consumer going to do? She's going to maximize u subject to x plus 2y is less than i, right? x times px, which is 1, plus y times py, which is 2, must be less than the income i. And we also have floating around in the background two implicit assumptions that x and y are both weakly positive. So you can consume zero of each of these goods, but you can't consume negative amounts of the goods. That's not allowed. So if we set this up a little more formally, we now have a Lagrangian. Remember, the Lagrangian is how we solve constrained optimization problems. And the Lagrangian associated with this maximization problem is log of x plus log of y minus our Lagrange multiplier lambda, and then the budget constraint x plus 2y minus i, and that thing has to be less than 0. Now, our first order conditions are going to be the log of, so we, we take a condition with respect to x, y, and lambda, x and y, Right, the log of x is 1 over x, and then we just get a lambda uh, from the budget constraint. With y, you get 1 over y, but then you have a 2 and a lambda from the budget constraint. And finally, the, uh, the last uh, first order condition is that the derivative with respect to lambda, which just returns that the actual budget constraint has to hold with equality and has to be 0. Right? Now, why is this not an inequality? Why, can't, why don't we have to worry about potentially the consumer spending less than i? And therefore, this budget constraint not holding with equality but with an inequality? Well, that's from Wallace's Wallace's Wallace, that guy's law, right? Log of x plus log of y is a strictly monotone function. If you give me more x or you give me more y, I'm going to do strictly better off. My utility function is going up. And that means that I'm going to spend all my income, and therefore, I don't have to worry about the case 
where x plus 2y is strictly less than i. I know that in the optimum, it's going to exactly equal i, and so I can just check those particular values, and I can use an equality constraint instead of an inequality constraint. So we have, um, from waller law, we have that x is equal to i minus 2i. I'm not sure what I meant by, by L1. I think that's a typo. So you, uh, I guess I meant L lambda. Um, so x is equal to i minus 2i. And then what we're going to do here is we're going to divide Lx by Ly. So this is the, uh, the first order condition for x and the first order condition for y. I'm just going to divide one by the other. And what I get is that y divided by x is equal to 1 half. Right? Um, I move over the lambdas to the other side. The lambdas cancel out, and I'm left with y over x equals 1 half. Now I can plug that back into the first bullet point, right? So I have x equals 1 minus 2y, and then I plug in what I know about uh, y, that y is equal to 1 half x, and I get back that y over i minus 2y is equal to 1 half, um, and that means you can solve this, and you get that y star is equal to 4. y star is the optimal value. So the consumer optimally would choose y star equal to i over 4, and then you can plug that back in through the previous either of the previous conditions, and you get that x star then equals i over 2. What does that mean? It means the Walrasian demand of x when, uh, the Walrasian demand when i is equal to i and the vector of prices is 1, 2, is the vector bundle i over 2, i over 4, which means that the consumer optimally, uh, the consumer optimally demands i over 2 units of x and i over 4 units of y. Uh, so that's all for this video, and then we're going to analyze that solution a little bit more in the next video.